marketing committee. <laughs> so um, to get started, want to tee up the topic by uh, speaking to a, a installation that happened back in 2008. Now, you know, keep in mind, this is 2008. Uh, but before I do that, let me get through some T's and C's here. Uh, so uh, first, we've muted all the phone lines. So um, if you have any questions, uh, please just type them into the Q&A field of the Zoom menu. And then we do have some legal disclaimers that uh, please take a moment to review. And also we have the uh, anti-solicitation as well. So with that, that takes me to the topic of uh, 2008 and uh, this optical land, optical land installation out at Sandia National Labs. And out there, uh, the optical line terminals, there were 18 of them at the initial deployment and they replaced 600 big iron full-size full switches 90% reduction in space and material. Uh, that installation reduced energy consumption at the lab by 65%. It was calculated at a million kilowatt hours per year, and that's annual. And uh, I always like the, the fun fact, uh, as they were remo removing some of the uh, copper cabling, they were actually able to recycle that keeping it out of landfills. And they actually netted $80,000 on that recycled materials. Um, even better yet, centrally managed uh, across a um, 21 square mile campus serving 265 buildings. So, you know, they were, instead of doing truck rolls, instead of dispatching IT folks all around that campus, they were able to manage the whole network down to the end end devices uh, from one screen at the NMS. And then 10 years later, they did do an upgrade to 10 gig connectivity. And that was done all, all over the same optical splitters and single mode fiber. So the question becomes, how many points did they get for LEED certification or Green Globe certification? And this is 2008. Um, I don't know of any, I, I, I truly don't. Um, back then, the best they were doing was um, getting innovation points with leads. So this tees up the topic for today. I mean, how can we do a better job at this? How can we educate the market and uh, get more involved with USGBC, Green, uh, TIA Spire, all those different organizations, and actually see what more we can be doing, driving better sustainability in the, uh, uh, in building infrastructure. So with that, we have two presenters today. Uh, we're going to have Gala cover the Corning corporate headquarter case study. And then we're gonna have Jeff cover a embodied carbon footprint case study as well. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Gala to start her presentation. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I'm Gala Arundel and a market development director at Corning Optical Communications. Um, Corning is the you know, global leader in fiber optic cable and fiber optic connectivity. Um, and we also have a full end-to-end -end fiber to the edge passive optical networking solution. So today what I'll be showing you is the corporate our corporate head office in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was built in and we moved into right before COVID. Um, so 2019, we moved in. And so what we, we deployed there, a full fiber to the edge, um, what we call software defined networking solution there. And we subsequently um, retroactively went in and did a sustainability case study that has um, recently been published. And I'm going to go through the results with you here today.
So as I said, this is the new head office building. It's in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's about 180,000 square foot building, a modern smart building. Um, we did use a wireless first environment, meaning that there's no um, desktop connectivity. Uh, we, we use, we're almost, not, not 100, but we're very heavily reliant on a Wi-Fi and cellular network within the building. And as with that, we deployed, we deployed many different applications, you know, all the, everybody's connectivity to the phone and computer, access control, security cameras, Wi-Fi. Um, we have our Crestron AV system, a scheduling panel for every room. So it's a full smart building. We have sound masking, etc. So every single thing in the network is actually being supported over this this network, um, which enables about 1,392 ports. So a little bit more about the design. As I said, we used a fiber to the edge sort of network design using our software defined networking. Um, some ports in the in the in the, the architecture are using the passive GPON solution, passive optical LAN, and some are just using point-to-point -point active Ethernet, um, but fully capable on our software-defined networking solution. Um, what we are looking at here in terms of this um, case study is what if we had done the building using a legacy copper category 6A network versus the design that we did do. So as we all know, in a legacy copper LAN environment, um, this is, you know, we have IDS on every floor and we have distributed power and switching. And then from there, you connect each and every device in the network on a category cable and that's limited to the three, approximately 300 foot distance limitation for, for POE enabled devices. Um, on the fiber to the edge design, we were able to consolidate all of the switches as well as the remote power in the one MDF that we have in the building. So we went from having six IDFs, if we had done the copper, traditional copper networking, just to one main MDF. And we have one distributed IDF just for redundancy on floor three. Um, in terms that we used our fiber and power composite or hybrid cable to deploy to a zone architecture. And in the zone, we have our software enabled access nodes. Um, the fiber and power was using two fiber, well, actually only one fiber is used to each zone, and then two 20 gauge copper conductors. From the zone, we can then uh, attach multiple IP enabled, POE enabled devices. So you'll see there that we used about 82,000 linear feet of composite cable in the building. And if we had done this with the traditional Cat 6A, we would have had to over 252,000 linear feet of Cat 6A cable to attach every device. Um, so we significantly reduced, well, we, have, we eliminated the Cat 6A drops. We significantly in um, reduced our cable trays as well, because we were able to use this um, composite cable to the zone. So we went from 12 inch wide cable trays down to six inch wide cable trays. And I'll show you some photos that show that they're practically empty. And we even got more ports to be enabled with this new solution versus if we had it done it with a category 6A um, traditional copper land. So this is the basis on which we did the sustainability case study. So first, before I kind of dive into the results of that, I wanted to just touch on what some terminology here. So we have, we'll be talking about the life cycle assessment of the building and of the network infrastructure. And for those of us who this is a new terminology, what is the life cycle assessment? It, it's often referred to as the cradle to grave evaluation. So it evaluates the inputs and the outputs and the potential environmental impacts of a product system throughout its entire life cycle. Um, so from the raw material extraction 
through its processing and manufacturing. And then once it's finished, it is incorporates the distribution and the use. And then finally, the end of life. So you'll see it's a full life cycle here. Um, we will focus today on what we call greenhouse gas emissions, um, carbon dioxide and other gases there. And, and we this all of these gases and these greenhouse gases get converted into what they call the carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2E. So that's AKA there, that's what we really refer to when we say a carbon footprint of a material or a building. It's really referring to this carbon dioxide equivalent of the greenhouse gas emissions. So the first thing we did is we, we looked at the cabling itself, right? And in this particular case study, we focused in on the cable and on the cable trays and not on the electronics in this first phase of the of the analysis. But this we will see how impactful just focusing on the cable and the cable trays were. Um, so if we take a, a typical meter of cat of cat six A UTP plenum type cable. And then we take an equivalent meter of this uh, composite cable, what we call Actify, it's two fibers, two, car two copper conductors, 20 gauge. And we do that life cycle assessment based on, we in Corning, we use the third party to, to validate our life cycle assessment for the Actify cable. And then we did, we use published what they call environmental product declarations or EPDs. So this is what companies publish to sort of define what is their life cycle assessment numbers for their particular product. So we used a published EPD on the uh, that we got off the internet for a typical Cat 6A plenum UTP cable. We did include in this particular analysis the use and installation piece because we incorporated that into a, a um, as a live example of uh, operational carbon, which is what I'll talk about here next. So this is the per meter of the Cat 6A. You would see there's about three times less carbon footprint per meter of cable. Again, this is in the kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that's a big impact just meter to meter on the cable. And then we also went in and looked at cable trays out there and compared what a 24 inch mesh cable trays EPD was versus a 12 inch. And you'll see there, just base, basic math really, it's about two X reduction in the carbon footprint per meter of the cable tray. So uh, with that, we then went in and looked at the actual, um, the actual building. So, but before I go there, I want to just explain a little bit about embodied carbon and operational carbon. So embodied carbon is the actual um, carbon that gets incorporated into the building as, at the, as, as it's built. So it includes all the materials and, and that, you know, from the life cycle assessment I talked about that goes into the building itself. It, in, an operational carbon, the difference there is that this is the carbon that goes into operating the building. So it usually is the energy and the electricity consumption, water consumption, et cetera, that goes into operating the building. Historically, there's been a, a significant attention to the operational side of the um, carbon. But now and more and more now we're focusing on what we call the embodied carbon. This is the upfront carbon that goes into what we call a whole building life cycle assessment. And right now, if you if you if you go look at the data, you'll see that about the buildings in the world today account for about 39% of the annual energy related greenhouse gas emissions, and 28% is usually associated with operational carbon. And but an but a, an eleven percent of that is really now focusing on the embodied carbon. And we all know that there are these a lot of uh, global initiatives to reduce the total embodied carbon and and the operational carbon of buildings. So with that, uh, some of these terms are brand new to us. I recognize. So please, if at the end you have any questions, let us know. But we looked at the actual building that I told you. 
about. And I told you, friends, that we use much less cable, about 70% less cable going from the 250,000 linear feet to, to 82,000 linear feet of ACPI cable. So that's a 70% reduction just in the cable. Of course, I also said we went from six IDFs just to one main MDF IDF. And so that reduced the carbon footprint of the of the building and the need to have IDS or what we call intermediate distribution frames, which is on every floor. And the main distribution frame is where all the equipment is generally. So in the, our building, you see a beautiful picture here of our glass enclosed MDS. Um, it's a showcase for us. So typically you wouldn't find this in a glass enclosure, but for us, we're very proud to show all the equipment we have there. And of course, we know that when we are building out um, telecom rooms on every floor, there's a, a significant saving if we don't have to build those out. And we, we estimate between 50 and probably more than $15,000 per telecom room. And then, of course, we use about 50% less cable trays, uh, you know, the, the, going from 12 to 24 to 12 inch cable trays. And you can see from that picture there that they're practically empty. So there's lots of room for expansion. So then we take a look now at the combination of the fact that the UTP cable has uh, three times more carbon. And then we also take into consideration that we use 70% less cable. So when we multiply those two together, our um, results showed that when we actually reduce the carbon footprint of the building by 9x, so this was all went into the embodied carbon, the day one embodied carbon, going from over 40 metric tons CO2e, if we had done it with a copper network, versus less than five metric tons CO2e with the composite Actify cable. So that's a very significant reduction. What else did we get with that network? We were able to really install you know, future-ready bandwidth for all of our needs today as well as in tomorrow. Um, since we've installed this building, we've put in 5G millimeter wave small cells throughout without adding new cabling. We are pre prepped for Wi-Fi 7 upgrades. Again, with um, virtually unlimited bandwidth, we don't have to add or replace any cables. So that really helps with the whole rip and replace cycle. And um, of course, we also, from that one main MDF, we're extending the reach to also the outdoor connectivity all from one, one room. So when you think about all this rip and replace in a typical life cycle of a building, which is you know 30 years minimum, but we use 30 years in our assessment, we estimated that if you were doing it with category cable, you will need to probably add or rip and replace cables to support all these future needs. When you consider three, um, we, we said we'll do this probably three times, like every 10 years. So that actually impacted our total building life cycle um, uh, footprint reduction three times nine, 27 times X reduction in our carbon footprint when we consider it over a 30 year life cycle. So this is quite significant. And I think again, as, as John said in the beginning, we're starting to quantify what this really means in terms of life cycle assessment, embodied carbon and CO2E and operational carbon. So let's take a little bit look now at the operational carbon. As I said, we actually did an audit with a train, which is was our, our HVAC company. And most of the um, operational carbon reduction really comes from looking at what is the energy savings related to cooling these five IDFs. So when we look at eliminating five um, of these IDFs and all of the HVAC load, as well as equipment in related to that, this independent analysis done by train showed that we are going to be delivering about 69,000 kilowatt hours per year of energy savings. That equates to 49 metric tons per year of CO2 e emissions. Um, and as you could see, the EPA has a little equivalency calculator that you can use. And that one shows that it's equivalent to about 121,000 miles driven by an average gas powered car, or 806 trees tree seedlings grown over 10 years, so quite significant. 
Of course, in addition to the to the energy, you're also saving cost of, of electricity, as well as the cost upfront of the capital expenditure of that HVAC equipment and, and the cost of operating it. So it's quite a significant savings overall. So not only did we get more um, or less carbon, um, we also spent a whole lot less in, in actually the upfront capex of the versus the legacy land. So again, using a third party um, analysis, we were able to define what it would have been if we had used all that extra copper cabling and, and all the IDS on every floor. And we'll see here that we actually saved about 29% overall in the upfront capex. So we got more, more bandwidth and more sustainable network and we spent a whole lot less. So with that, this is just a summarizing again of all the things that we got out of this more sustainable network. We we reduced our, we got cost savings, reduced OPEX, CAPEX, but more importantly, we, uh, we got a future ready building and a much lower carbon footprint with our brand new H court headquarters and a way to quantify as well the effect that this network has on the building. So with that, with that, um, John, I will now hand it over to um, to Jeff. Thanks, Gail. I appreciate it. Great uh, presentation. Thanks for the great information. Um, my name is Jeff Van Horn. I'm the president of Uber Data Networks. Let me turn my video on here. Uh, we are a system integrator for optical LAN technology located in Ohio, and we provide solutions nationwide in many uh, different market segments, including corporate office buildings, K through 12 schools, hotels and resorts, manufacturing plants. And today we're going to highlight one of our, uh, one of our uh, projects um, that was in a uh, large office tower. Um, and it was a corporate headquarter building, the new construction project that we were involved in. And it was 34 stories tall. So it's a pretty sizable project, about 750,000 usable square feet and uh, about 12,000 ethernet ports and over 50, uh, around 5,000 employees or so. This is a pre-COVID project and very large facility. And initially the project was um, uh, designed for a traditional active ethernet type of a uh, type of a network. And they also were desiring to implement PUE lighting. And that's one unique aspect of our analysis that we're, um, that we're putting in on this analysis. The PUE lighting was really to help them achieve specific um, carbon and climate initiative goals by the year 2030. So the basis of design was for a voice data in a wireless network integrated solution over an active ethernet network. In addition to that, the manufacturer of the equipment that they were using um, was also offered a, um, a uh, digital building architecture for lighting. And so when they went through the analysis and they got the design and the, and the bids back, they found out that the solution that they were looking for with an active uh, Ethernet solution with CAT 6A cable did not adequately meet their necessary sustainability goals. The project was also over budget. And that's when they reached out to our company to talk about a fiber optic local air network, a fiber LAN, and talk about what that would mean using fiber optic infrastructure instead of CAT 6 and also uh, integrating the intelligent LED lighting over a uh, direct DC microgrid uh, architecture. So when we look at these, uh, these initiatives, our customers talk about ESG quite often, and I'm sure that's a topic that we're all very um, familiar with these days. Um, environmental, social, and governance initiatives to attain some level of carbon savings over a certain period of time. And over the years, Appalan, we presented webinars that really focused on the operational carbon aspect of using optical land technology, where once it's installed in the building, 
there are significant savings in energy utilization, uh, reduction of closets, reduced cooling, things that Gail talked about in her operational analysis. Well, what we're going to focus on today is the embodied carbon component. And being able to do that now in the past couple of years with the introduction of EPDs, that really allows us to quantify uh, what type and how much of the materials we're able to reduce in a given facility. Um, so on the, the bottom right, the, the annual global CO2 emissions from a construction perspective, 23% of CO2 emissions is attributed to putting metal inside commercial buildings. Uh, concrete, steel, aluminum, um, those compromise 23% of the CO2 emissions. So when we take a look at what kind of benefits that we get by using a fiber optic LAN instead of a CAT6 LAN, where do we find savings and reductions that uh, equate to uh, reduce body carbon? And we're able to reduce a lot of steel. So when we look at racking, cable tray, even rebar within the reinforced concrete, uh, we're able to reduce a lot of the steel. Copper, obviously, reducing a lot of the CAT6 and CAT6A cable and power cables when we look at our, our intelligent lighting analysis. And then aluminum, a lot of cable tray, basket tray to hold the cables. We're able to reduce that significantly because the size and the weight of the fiber optic cabling is quite a bit lower. And then as we start working on more integration of these digital smart buildings with the reduced weight of all this material, we're able to now look at how we're able to reduce the design of the foundation and we're able to further reduce concrete. And that's just to have the building constructed. And now when we look throughout the use of the, of the cabling and, uh, and then the disposal, when we go through cable refreshes, a lot of the material that's pulled out of a building in the form of cabling uh, hopefully gets recycled. Some of it hits the landfill, but we have this whole disposal aspect that has an impact on embodied carbon. So on the embodied carbon, it's the manufacturer transport installation of construction materials to get to the site. So EPDs, those are environmental product declaration documents. And these are new documents in the past couple of years that the manufacturers of cable assemblies, um, uh, different products that we use in construction of commercial office buildings, uh, this data has become available to allow us to do these life cycle assessments to determine uh, what the embodied carbon footprint is on a given project. And so this uh, assessment that we'll look at today, we're going to we're going to uh, compare a, uh, the, the impact of a fiber optic land to a traditional CAT6 land. And we're gonna look at it in several different areas in the form of materials. So when we look at the EPDs, it has many different sections in the materials. It'll break it out into what percentage of the material is the jacket, the insulation, the binder, the conductors, obviously, uh, filler and tape, and even the wood pallets that it's stacked on for transport. So it measures the amount of pounds of material for a given length of product. And that allows us to understand how that, the material makeup of the product is made up. And then it goes on to break out the energy utilization to construct the cable, transport the, the uh, material on site and put the material inside of the facility. That's measured in megajoules for a given length. And so we're looking at everything from raw material to the manufacturing process, even down to manufacturing and use, and then the waste disposal, which all comes to uh, what Gala mentioned, that the net cradle to grave impact, the total energy used for a given length of that product. And then it also looks into waste on the disposal side. Um, there's a certain amount of landfill avoidance that can be achieved if everything is, um, is recycled. And then overall, the life cycle impact assessment. And this is really where the, uh, the, the real information comes in. And there are many different parameters within that, different areas that are studied within the impact assessment. The two that we're going to focus on today, the global warming and the ozone depletion. The global warming is uh, measured as kilograms of CO2 equivalents. And the ozone depletion is kilograms of trichloromethane equivalents. 
and that's what impacts our ozone layer. So to get back to the to the architecture of this uh, project, and um, so when the original project had 28 total IDF closets, and the IDF closet is one on each floor, and that's where the worker switches and the cooling systems and the racking and cable tray are, are built out in. And from a, a, the traditional network that was originally bid for this project, uh, Cat 6A cable, of course, they can run up to 300 feet maximum distance. The average cable run on this project was 175 feet on each floor. So that was used in our parameters and we're determining the overall length of material in our analysis. Um, what was the total length of the runs and the total number of runs and everything averaged out to about 175 feet. So when we look at the, the fiber land, the optical land design, uh, we were able to reduce the closet utilization by 19 closets. So the optical land design only uses nine IDF closets instead of 28. So obviously there's quite a bit of savings there. Coming out of the IDF closet, uh, we also used a powered fiber composite uh, uh, fiber optic cabling with a pair of 18-2 copper pair um, inside the uh, composite cable. The 18-2 is used for uh, class two powering of the ONT devices that are out in the uh, out in the zone. So we had a single strain of fiber and an 18-2 uh, pair of copper conductors for remote powering to the ONTs. And in this design, the ONTs were several different models of ONTs. Some were mounted up in the plenum space, connecting to wireless access points, access control gateway, security cameras. Uh, other ONTs were mounted inside uh, technology panels in the cubicle furniture. And other ONTs were in-wall ONTs that were mounted inside the, um, the uh, gang boxes and offices and conference rooms. Uh, but the average length to the ONTs averaged 175 feet throughout the property. And then from the ONTs, some of the ONTs required uh, CAT6 cables to the endpoints. Others did not. Um, the CAT6A cabling, uh, many of them were patch cords. Uh, some also had um, uh, pre-cut runs that we had to make. Uh, but overall, they averaged about 50 feet per run. So when we look at our life cycle assessment, we're taking into account and comparing CAT6A cabling on the traditional design and on the optical land design, we're taking into account the composite cable and also the CAT6 cable runs out to the, um, to the uh, end devices. So when we put all this together, uh, there's a tremendous amount of information, these uh, EPDs. When we translate that into our worksheets, it equates to a tremendous amount of information in the worksheets that we, um, that we uh, boil it all down to a few common parameters that are of interest. But when we, you know, we've talked about the, the significant reduction in the cabling needed with a uh, optical land design. And the graphic on the right-hand side, the size comparison is there just to give a pretty straightforward representation of what do we mean when we talk about reduction in cabling. Uh, this is a comparison coming out of your IDF closet. We will have a single fiber composite cable coming out of the IDF closet, and that's the uh, shown by the fiber and 18-2 cable, uh, that will run to an ONT. That ONT provides between four and eight gigabit ethernet ports or 10 gig multi-rate ports, depending on ONT model. And these cables are shown uh, to scale, and this gives you an idea of, of just the amount of, of, of size and number of cables we're ever able to eliminate out of the IDF closet. So when we calculate all the parameters on the table to the left, when we look at the overall cable solution cost of all of the CAT6 A cable compared to all of the fiber, all of the 18.2 within the composite cable and the uh, shorter CAT6 cables to the uh, devices, we've reduced the total cable length by 50%. So the traditional design, it was over 2 million feet length and in the optical land, it was under a million. So we had 50% savings on cable length. Um, the cross-section pathway is very interesting. This is the total amount of space coming out of the IDF closets, and this really determines the amount of um, basket tray that we're going to need, sometimes the penetrations needed uh, to get to certain areas of the building. 
but our, our pathway space was reduced by 92%. Uh, that's a huge change, a very big reduction, and it makes the design of the building much, much easier. Total cable weight came in about five times, four to five times less, 86,000 pounds of total weight for the cable solution, Cat 6A, 25,000 for fiber optic LAN, about 70% reduction. And then the total cost, and these are things that we presented in the past with Apple LAN, very uh, consistent results, about 35, 36% savings on cost. So just on the, the raw parameters, there's just a lot of savings on length and weight. Now, the interesting piece comes with the life cycle assessment, looking at our sustainability. The amount of energy used in megajoules on the CAT 6A side was almost 5.4 million megajoules. So about 72% reduction in the energy needed to manufacture, transport, and install the fiber optic network instead of a CAT 6A network. From a waste perspective, there's about a 70% reduction in waste. And then global warming and ozone depletion, which are the two key parameters here. Uh, global warming and, and kilograms of CO2 equivalents reduced 75%. And then the ozone depletion reduction, almost 92% reduction in ozone depletion of putting in a fiber optic land compared to a CAT 6A. And so this was just for the base design, comparing the voice, the data, and the wireless. Now, when we take a look at the, the intelligent lighting, which is an area that our company has been doing a lot of research in, we've been deploying DC microgrids for several years now, direct DC power to lighting. It has a very, very large impact uh, to savings in, in a building, and not just in, in cost and weight, but also from a sustainability perspective. So. In this facility, when we added the intelligent lighting component using direct DC power and class four power distribution, um, we're driving the lights with direct DC power directly in some areas, in other areas using intelligent node controllers uh, to control the lighting, but everything is through direct DC power. What that allows us to do is not only use the fiber and the composite cabling and, um, and low voltage cabling for the data, the voice and the wireless. We're also using that for the lighting system, including the, um, the, the, the life safety lights within the building. And we're able to eliminate the high voltage cabling above the ceiling for the lights. So commercial lighting runs on 277 volts AC. We're able to eliminate that high voltage cabling along with the conduit, along with the jun junction boxes. And that is a significant savings it's in addition to a lot of the parameters that we've delivered uh, today. So when we took it, take a look at the parameters again in the table, we still have a 60% reduction in weight, 45% uh, reduction in cost uh, compared to doing the same thing with PUE lighting over CAT 6A and CAT 6 cabling. From a sustainability perspective, we're still realizing some great savings in energy waste. Global warming is reduced by nearly 70%. Ozone depletion is still above 92%. So, you know, very similar, great numbers there. But a couple of the things that came out of this analysis that was very interesting was when we use a fiber optical LAN to also include the intelligent lighting components, uh, the total overall cost of the cabling, including the lighting, was still 27% lower than just doing the base voice data network for the CAT 6A. So we're still lower in price than just a base voice data network, but in addition, we've eliminated the 12 gauge three wire high voltage cabling above the ceiling. So there's a significant amount of further reduction and further reduction of the embodied carbon impact of this building that's in addition to the savings that we're representing today. So this is an area of continued research um, there's a lot more optimization that's taking place in these types of designs. We're still fairly early in the um, adoption of DC microgrids in smart buildings and how many different components that we can place on those systems. When we look at a total 10-year life cycle analysis on this particular facility, the way that we, that we looked at it was 
Um, if they were, if this property were to put in a Cat 6A infrastructure today, uh, within a 10 year period, on average seven years, they would need to come back and put in an optical infrastructure um, anyway. Cat 6A is the last copper cabling defined for local area networks. And after Cat 6A is the fiber optic LAN. So in this 10 year assessment, if they would have put in a Cat 6A infrastructure and then put in a fiber optic LAN in seven to 10 years, overall savings that we're realizing here is a three times reduction in the cable infrastructure cost, over a five times reduction in total energy used in megajoules, over a five times reduction in CO2 generated, and, and greater than 13 times reduction in ozone um, depletion. So pretty powerful parameters that came out of this and result. Um, there's a lot more uh, of future research that we're doing that's gonna drive even further savings. And when we look at what we can do in the future, the, um, on the high voltage cabling, we're able to eliminate about four tons of, um, and 73,000 feet of cable on just the lighting cabling. On ladder rack, we eliminated about 20 tons and when we start looking at integration of direct DC environmental controls and other systems in the digital smart building ecosystem, we're going to find a lot more savings. And these numbers on our life cycle assessment are going to increase from there. So uh, that's the end of my analysis. Uh, John, I'm going to hand it back to you. I know we're running a little short on time and we've got some Q&A to get to. Right on. Well, well, first, thank you, Gayla. And thank you, Jeff. That was real insightful and, and some new information probably for everybody. Um, we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of this presentation. I already see lots of good questions around power over ethernet delivery. Um, but um, I, I'm just, I wanna remind you all that type in your question into that Zoom menu. I think it's down at the bottom and, and we'll, we'll start banging these out. We'll, we'll probably take five or 10 minutes, but um, just to give you some time to get typing, uh, let me just go over a little bit about Apple Land. And we're here as an organization to um, promote and advocate for the use of fiber inside buildings and across campuses. So within the enterprise local network, uh, we focus on marketing, design, installation, and education that uh, helps you all do this better. Um, we have a great group of world-class organizations all coming together for this cause and always encourage everybody to join and get involved. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, you can help us impact industry research. You can help us do trainings like we do at, at Dixie events and like we do here on these webinars. Um, you can get involved with blogs and, and help us out on social media. And also, you know, we do do some good work around getting articles published in trade magazines. So there's lots of great stuff that, to be done there. So I really encourage you all to join the organization and, and, and get, get involved. So with that, uh, let me get into some questions. And, um, you know, first off, the, the power over Ethernet questions. Um, I'll probably let both Jeff and Gayla, both of you speak to this, but I'll, I'll go to Gayla first, give Jeff a little break. Uh, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about composite cabling and POE delivery? Yeah, so um, I see the question. The composite cable is a class two power. It, it is delivering class two power. So up to the 100 watts as we know for class two power. Um, Depending on the gauge of the copper that you put in the composite cable, that's where you get up to the 2,000 feet. So um, we have a little calculation um, depending on the power you need at the edge, so whether you need 30 watts or 60 or 90, um, and then also you know what gauge of the copper you're going to order. So for the over 2,000 feet and for outdoor applications mainly, we go to 14 or even 12 gauge, which is the lowest, the, the thickest that we offer. Um, but for inside the building, 
where we, in our building, we used um, 20 gauge inside and we used, I think, 16 gauge to the outdoor locations. So, um, again, you can get up to 2,000, but you need to do a little bit of your um, your math and calculations when you're trying it, when up front when you're designing the network. And of course, the edge devices, this is something that a lot of people kind of don't realize as well, is that in that zone where we have our ONT or, or access node, as we call it, we're converting back to the POE uh, to power the edge device. So the edge devices are still being powered by a POE you know, type of um, interface with that shorter length of a category sort of cable jumper. Um, but the the so you, you can technically put some extra distance between the zone and the edge device, theoretically, again, like 300 feet, but you need to kind of look at your losses as well. But from the zone, you can start calculating what is your POE limits on the copper from that area. Jeff, anything to add? Yeah, I, I looked in the, the questions and one other, um thing to address on the the ONTs every every switch has a power budget to it uh, and if it's an access switch in a closet or an ONT uh, which also is a switch on the ONTs the PUE power budget ranges anywhere from 60 watts up to close to 200 watts per ONT and one of the questions asked about 90 watts of PUE times eight ports was almost a thousand watts um, you know every device is a maximum PUE power budget that we design to and and each port on an access switch or an ONT isn't going to put out 90 watts of PUE simultaneously. So we always work within the PUE power budget. Uh, the ONTs don't require a lot of power themselves to operate. The majority of the power that we deliver over class two power over the composite cables is in the form of PUE to the end devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to get to some other questions here. So uh, we'll go back to you, Gayla. Um, why are the results for embodied carbon three times per meter of cable and nine times reduction for the case study? So I think um, I, I tried to explain that a little bit clearly, but the when we looked at the 3x reduction, that was just looking at a single cable, one meter of a single cable of category 6A versus the composite. Um, the, the 9x came from using so much less cable. In our case, we used about 70% less cable. So that's a compounding factor to you know, have um, three, three X less carbon in the actual cable and then so much less cable. So that ended up with the nine X reduction in the embodied carbon um, of the whole cable infrastructure. Okay. And Jeff, this one I'll, I'll give to you. Uh, how is EPD information generated and who produces that information? So the, the EPDs are generated by the manufacturers themselves. Uh, many times they use an outside uh, facility to help out with the uh, EPT generation. Now, so the EPDs, the, the data inside the EPD is very, very thorough. And there's a lot of um, information that, that really is generated through material science of understanding exactly what components what materials are in a given device. And, um, and those EPDs are um, generally uh, created by outside third-party firms, but the manufacturers themselves list the EPDs typically on their website for each of the products that they make. Now, EPDs right now, we're, we find EPDs on fiber optic cabling, uh, category cabling, um, like 18.2 low voltage copper cabling, cable trays. Um, but that it's fairly limited right now because the EPDs are fairly new in the next couple of years. But we do expect to see EPDs coming out from switch manufacturers, ONT manufacturers, um, enclosures, and more devices. And the idea with an EPD, if we can take all of the data of every device that is put into a building, we can quantify very explicitly the, um, the, the sustainability outcome of using that type of cable infrastructure. That's the goal long term. Yeah, and I'd encourage our listeners to uh, go to the Appalachian website, look at our members lists, and, and, and work with our members on these types of things. Okay, let me um, 
Gila, well, I'll give you this one. Uh, well, it, it has to do with your case study. How was the cellular DAS supported over Corning's uh, fiber network? So yeah, so as I said up front, our building was a wireless so, so we have a pervasive cellular. It's being delivered on a fiber to the edge network as well. So the same cabling infrastructure that you saw that's supporting all those applications. Um, we, some of the endpoints and are actually small cells, which run over the ethernet protocol, so on the full SD LAN, and then some of the endpoints are actually our fiber powered radio access network nodes. So um, we have some DAS equipment up in the head, in the MDF or the head end as we call it. And the, but the, but the, it is all converged over the cabling infrastructure. So yes, in our calculations, some of those endpoints are supporting the cellular DAS or the cellular small cells as well. And uh, Jeff and Gala, for both of your case studies, was there Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6? Um, so ours was Wi-Fi, wi has Wi-Fi 6 in it right now. As um, We actually upgraded already to Wi-Fi 6 from when we first um, did it. Um, but, you know, we're well positioned for Wi-Fi 7 because Wi-Fi 7 will use, mm -hmm. um, will, will need like 40 gigs at the edge and uh, our cabling infrastructure will be able to support that once it's, it's available. Okay. Um, Jeff, back to you. How are high voltage 12.3 lighting cables removed with intelligent lighting? That's a good one. Yeah, so the um, commercial LED lighting fixtures are driven by AC. Right, typically 277 volt circuits above the ceiling. Um, those cables are running conduit through the junction boxes into the light fixtures themselves. Uh, those light fixtures have a little AC to DC converter to drive the LEDs directly with DC. Um, that AC to DC conversion within each of the lamp fixtures is a source of loss, and it's the greatest component for um, uh, failure within those light fixtures. Uh, when we use direct DC lighting, we're running DC directly into the light fixture itself. So there's no AC component whatsoever. And the powers run over typically 18.2 copper pairs, sometimes 16.2, depending on the distance. Uh, but it is carrying DC directly to the light fixtures because again, LED light fixtures run natively on DC power. And uh, we're able to eliminate all of the uh, AC um, high voltage cabling for the lights when we go to direct DC power. Okay. Okay. With that, I want, again, I'm going to thank Jeff and Gala. Fantastic presentations. I know you all are leading your industry and this is very at the edge of uh, technology right now. And we appreciate you uh, sharing this knowledge with everybody. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I want to go ahead and shut this down. However, you will be getting an email with a PDF of these slides shortly, and there will also be a survey associated with that email. On behalf of everyone at Apple Land, thank you for joining. Look forward to seeing you at Dixie Winter coming up uh, in February 5th and 9th in Tampa, and continue to get involved and stay involved with Apple Land. We'll, we'll do more some more webinars on topics just like this. So with that, thanks again. Everyone have a great day and a great rest of your week.